lunch and recess. I want to advise Council that I'm going to make a reference of the motion to quash that Council is addressing to Magistrate Judge Spiro so that he may attend to that while we proceed with the trial. And so I would urge uh, Council, whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten. McCarthy. Oh, yes, Mr. McCarthy, if you and uh, your opposite numbers uh, on the plaintiff's team and on the proponent's team would make yourself available to Magistrate Judge Spiro, he will be able to attend to this matter and, and deal with it. Of course. Ready to go? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You may continue with your direct examination, and I'll remind the witness you're still under oath. Yes, Your Honor. You understand that? Fine. Thank you, Your Honor. I, uh, I would like uh, to ask the witness to go back to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2389 and not discuss it until I ask you a question. I, I would like to proceed through this step by step. Um, First, is this a document that you have seen? Yes. And um, just in general terms, could you describe for the court what it is without mentioning anyone's name except the, the name of the individual uh, who, whose name appears in the from line? Um, it is an, an email to many people from someone named Ned DeLessie. And are you aware that Mr. De DeLessie uh, it was, is a... Um, a member of the executive committee of protectmarriage.com. I am. And without disclosing the names or the titles of the individuals to whom this email was sent, can you generally describe the the, the nature of the, the people to whom this email was sent? In broad terms, I would describe it as the senior leadership of the Roman Catholic Church in California. And could you generally describe the, the subject matter of this email, at least as, the, as to the first page of the document, again, without going into any detail concerning that, the actual specific contents? Um, it appears to be um, sort of half of a thank you note, half of a celebratory message uh, on the election day, recounting the specific contributions that Catholic organizations and the church itself played in prosecuting the yes and a campaign? In going back to the top of the document, under the from line, there's a subject line. Could you read that for me? <laughs> it says, go to confession. And what, what is the date of the email? November the 4th, and, 2008. And, and is there a time, time stamp on it? Uh, 9.28 in the morning. Your Honor, I move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 2389 uh, the parties did, we did discuss this document. There's still a dispute about whether the whole thing can come in. I, I propose that it be entered into um, evidence um, subject to redaction um, and that I would only display the portions of the document that, that the parties agreed could be displayed, published uh, to the public and put on the screen for now and then we could resolve the, any other. I, I still believe this document is not covered by any privilege but to move things along would suggest we pr proceed that way. Mr. Puno? I believe it is. Hey, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, thank you, and thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. Everyone gets it wrong. Oh, well. <laughs> we, we, uh, we discussed this at length during the, the break, and uh, we're doing everything we can to accommodate uh, the plaintiffs on this, and we identified some portions of this that we were comfortable having uh, read to the witness, um, 
but the but the this is as has been described by the witness a communication between the executive director of the Catholic Conference of Bishops and the bishops who make up the Catholic Conference of Bishops and you know it, and the subject matter has to do with the church's involvement as I understand it from the witness um, we don't agree to lift uh, voluntarily the attorney's eyes only privilege for this entire document but we did earlier work out some highlighted portions that could be read to the witness without our objections so that's where we are at this moment well then do I understand it's mutually agreeable to the parties that we proceed with respect to the portions that you've highlighted and as to which there is no objection to uh, being read to the witness that is yes. correct, but as to admission of the entire document into evidence, um, we haven't uh, gotten there yet. All right. Well, uh, we'll deal with that when and if we Thank you, Your reach Honor. that point. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, I'd like to publish the, um, the newly redacted first page of Exhibit 20, Plaintiff Exhibit 2389, and then I'll ask the witness to read from the sections that um, have not been redacted. Uh, those paragraphs, and then I'll ask you a few. I'll ask the witness a couple of questions about the, that. Uh, maybe we can enlarge it so it's easier to read. Thank you. Would you like me to read it in its entirety? <coughs> yes, if you could, Professor. Thank you. Today is election day. I am sure you share my relief that it is finally here. We have all been subjected to the longest campaign for president in American history, and in our own state, the intensity of the campaign around Proposition Eight has been incredible. The directive. The direct involvement of the CCC has been unusual, though, although not unprecedented. Your Honor, I'm sorry to inter interrupt, but what's been posted on the screen is more than what has been highlighted and agreed to by the parties. Oh, I'm sorry. Was did were you? Do you want additional sentences? I had this sort of blocked up. That we I thought That's we had fine. agreed to these two paragraphs. And what's highlighted? Okay. Well, maybe I can ask um, our our team to um, <coughs> redact. In that second paragraph, um, everything, not that I like asking to have things redacted, let me just make that clear, but um, to move this along, the, fir the sentences um, that up until the, the uh, sentence that begins, the Catholic conference has played. So basically the first two sentences of the second paragraph, if we can redact those as well. In my apologies for the delay, Your Honor. Um, yeah, just just that. Yes, there we go. Thank you, Professor Segura. Could you pick up uh, reading with the now slim down, further slim down version of this exhibit? The Catholic Conference has played a substantial role in inviting Catholic faithful to put their faith in action by volunteering and donating. Led by the Knights of Columbus national donation of $1.15 million, other million dollar donors, and countless major donors, and with a significant percentage of, of the 90,000 online donors, the Catholic community has stepped up. Of course, this campaign owes an enormous debt to the LDS Church. I will comment specifically at a later time under separate cover about their financial, organizational, and management contributions to the success of the effort. The ProtectMarriage.com campaign has surpassed $37 million in donations. Thank you, Professor Segura. What, what about this document, and in particular those passages that you read, uh, bears on your analysis of the array of political opposition that gay men and lesbians face in the United States in general and in particular in California as it relates to Proposition 8? Well, certainly it, it's, it suggests that um, the fairly substantial uh, monetary resources of the Roman Catholic Church and its faithful were, were mobilized in, in substantial portion on behalf of the S on 8 campaign. It also suggests a fairly close cooperation between the Catholic Church and the LDS Church um, which is certainly remarkable uh, 
from a historic perspective. Um, and uh, I was taken aback, frankly, uh, by the phrase um, financial, organizational, and management contributions uh, to the success of the effort, which suggests a very close coordination um, between those organizations and the campaign. In your study of American politics and political science, to your recollection, have you ever seen an example where two churches of the scope and size and power of the Catholic Church and the LDS Church have banded together and arrayed themselves against a particular minority group in society? I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't claim to have an exhaustive knowledge of the political action of, of those churches forever, but I would suggest that this is unprecedented in my experience. Let's turn to the next exhibit, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2552. And, Your Honor, I would move, I move, it. well, actually, let me ask the witness a couple of questions first. Have, is this a document that you've seen before, sir? Yes, it is. And is it a document you reviewed this week in preparing for your testimony once we received this document and the production that, that uh, proponents of Proposition 8 made to the plaintiffs in this case? Yes, it is. I, Your Honor, I move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 2552. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, 2552 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Professor Segura, can you describe your understanding of this document and how it relates to your analysis of the political powerlessness of gay men and lesbians? Um, this document appears to be a personal email from the chairman of the uh, Protect Marriage effort, um, and it recounts uh, the, um, the financing of the signature petition gathering, uh, signature gathering phase of the Prop 8 campaign. I would like to publish this exhibit, 2552, to the screen, please. The, in your understanding is um, the email line from, maybe we can highlight that, Ron P. at CaliforniaFamily.org. Who do you understand Ron P. to be? Ron Prentice. And who do you understand Ron Prentice to be? Uh, the chairman of ProtectMarriage.com or the, the head in some manner. And what about, the, what, what was it about this document? What portion of this document did you find um, shed light on the opinions that you form that you're giving in this case? On the second page, um, the, the, the paragraph about a third of the way down the, the page that begins with the total. Could you read that for the record? The total projected cost for the qualification effort has been set at 1.5 million. Thus far, 1.25 million has been raised and spent. The monies have come from four primary sources thus far. The Catholic community of San Diego, due to the involvement of Auxiliary Bishop Cordelioni, Fieldstead and Company, who pledged 50 cents for each dollar raised in January for the effort, focus on the family, and small gifts from direct mail efforts by protectmarriage.com. Uh, you, are you uh, knowledgeable generally about the organization Focus on the Family? I am. What is Focus on the Family? Uh, it's a nationally prominent evangelical organization um, dedicated to supporting issue positions consistent with the evangelical community's preferences. Is it a group that has been known to be politically active? Uh, very much so. And um, going back to page one of the document, the first paragraph um, of the document, if we could pull that up, could you uh, could you read the just read that paragraph just into the record so we have it? Okay, I spoke with a person redacted um, in your office who suggested I send along some information. I serve as the CEO of the California Family Council. Our 501c4 organization, California Renewal, is the sponsoring organization for the marriage amendment that is attempting to qualify in California. Thus, I serve as the volunteer chairman of ProtectMarriage.com steering committee. What is it about this document that relates to your opinions on political powerlessness of gay, and, gay men and lesbians? Well, I drew from this two things. First of all, was the very early involvement of uh, the organized religious communities in the signature and petition gathering uh, phase of the, of the campaign. Uh, and the second thing I drew from it was that this was really a national political campaign, that Focus on the Family is, of course, a national organization 
uh, and therefore uh, communities, organizations, and leaders far and wide were involved in the effort. Adding focus on the family and the organization, other organizations mentioned in this document to the LDS Church and the Catholic Church that was discussed in the prior document, um, it, is that a coalition you've seen before arrayed against a particular minority group in the United States in a political battle? Um, I would say that there's probably one other issue position against which such a coalition might emerge, and that would be a, a pro-choice abortion rights position. Apart from that, I can't think of a minority group against whom such a coalition has been raised. Thank you. I'd like you to now turn to uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2554. And I'm going to ask you some general questions about this document. I'd like you to refrain from mentioning any of the names, um, but uh, because as you can see by the approach of Mr. Thompson, there's an objection to admission of this document. Uh, but um, have you seen this document before? I have. Does this document um, shed any light on the the powerful political forces arrayed against gay men and lesbians in connection with the Proposition 8 campaign in your mind. If I uh, may object. Um, <laughs> well, let's see. Let's get an answer to the question Sorry. first. Mm -hmm. Yes, it shed light, sheds light. All right. Mr. Oh, Mr. Puno again. Yes. <clears throat> your Honor, this is uh, still under attorney's eyes only uh, confidentiality. Um, as the court can probably see from the body of the message, the two and the CC uh, designations, from all appearances, this is an internal communication among leadership of a particular church. Uh, I don't see anything that connects it to the Prop 8 campaign uh, or that it was um, disclosed beyond the uh, church leadership officials. Uh, that are listed there. So we would object to uh, testimony about this document. Petros? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first, without revealing any, anything other than the following, um, I, I, I think I can reveal that it references the fact that the effort being discussed in, the, in this email is in concert with the leaders of many other faiths and community groups forming part of the protectmarriage.com coalition. This is a document that we received in production from the proponents of Proposition 8 in this case um, in the wake of the order rejecting their First Amendment claims and defining the core group. So I think it's not subject to a First Amendment privilege. It was clearly disseminated more widely than those who saw it, and therefore I, I believe it should be admissible. Your Honor, the... Uh, this Mr. Bentley is not one of the individuals that has been designated, that have been designated as in the core group. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, I, I really must clarify this document. How do I say this? The, whether or not any of these individuals are in the core of protectmarriage.com is completely a different issue. This is a document in the possession of one of our clients who is, or at the time, had a, 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 a was a church official and had a document in his possession revealing communications with other church officials. And that's the body of this. Now, it, it may relate to Prop 8, but there is, uh, it, well, I think that we are, it would be very troublesome to say that religious organizations, churches, um, lose their ability to communicate within their leadership in the church because the church works with other churches and other organizations, um, even in a cooperative way in a campaign. As I understand it, this is a document that was in protectmarriage.com's files. Oh, Your Honor, in the, in the file of an individual who is a, an official proponent. One of the parties. Individuals, not the campaign committee. But it was in that individual's files. That's right. That individual is not part of this religious organization, correct? He is, Your Honor. That, that individual is 
a member of the organization, a member of the religious denomination, and at the time had a position of authority in that church, and was sent this email in that in connection with his. In other words, Your Honor, someone can be on the executive committee and be an official proponent, and they can also be involved with their church. And this is a communication about Prop 8 but among church officials with one of our pro proponents who was also a church official. This, in other words... Well, but he is a, he's one of the proponents. He's an individual intervener defendant in the case. <clears throat> the, the document relates to the Prop 8 campaign. If there has been a disclosure... It relates to the church's uh, support for Prop 8. This is not a publication of the campaign. This is not a, uh, a document produced by protectmarriage.com. This is an internal church communication. But I don't understand how, if it is a document that relates to the Prop 8 campaign, in the files and possession of one of the defendant interveners, how it can have some kind of uh, privilege attached to it. Well, because there's a... There's a it, it obviously falls outside the First Amendment privilege as defined by the Ninth Circuit. Absolutely ag agree with that, Your Honor, because that First Amendment privilege articulated by the Ninth Circuit was with regard to the campaign's internal formulation of messaging and strategy. We're on a completely different uh, field here. We're dealing with the religious association of a, of, a, of a religious denomination and their ability to communicate with one another within the walls of the church. Boutros? i make a couple of points. First, I don't see how Mr. Puno and protectmarriage.com have standing to assert this uh, First Amendment privilege on behalf of the, the people who wrote this document, number one. Well, he can, he can assert it on behalf of uh, the individual that he represents. Individually named defendant. That would be <clears throat> Mr. Jansen. And which named defendant are we talking about? Mr. Jansen. Mr. Jansen. Jansen. Yes. Okay. So um, assuming there's some level of standing, uh, um, the, the, uh, I would direct the court to the first sentence and again, I think I can read this without bringing down the First Amendment. I am the, going to object, Your Honor, to, to this, this internal church communication being read aloud in court. But let, me, let, me, let me try it this way, Your Honor. The document on its face says that it relates to the, public, the, the role in the public affairs of the Prop 8 campaign. And then in the third pair, or the fourth paragraph, it talks all about the campaign and the fact that certain officials, who I won't name, um, even though I don't think that name is confidential, who will report directly to the protectmarriage.com coalition leaders. So it seems to me this is a classic, it's, an, it's a document that's in the files of a person who sat on the executive committee of protectmarriage.com precisely to play this role in this broad coalition that breaches and breaks down any limits between these groups for this effort in the political sphere and, and then arrays against the, the folks on the other side of Proposition 8. So I think it, it's, it's hardly the kind of sensitive religious tract that might otherwise be subject to protection under the First Amendment. Honor, Mr. Jansen testified in his deposition that he, at this time, was a member of, and I forgive me, I don't remember the exact name, but it was the Public Affairs something something office of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That was a role that he played independent of the executive committee of protectmarriage.com. The references in capital letters, in, in title caps, to public affairs are, are reference to those church officials. And there's also a mention in the CC to, to I, won't, I won't say it aloud, but other leadership in the church. So this is a, an internal communication of the church. It certainly refers to the larger Prop 8 effort. But unless there is a communication from Mark Jansen to another organization in his capacity as an official proponent or as an executive committee member, which this is not, 
then we really are not having to be even concerned with what the core is and, and, and so on. This is an individually asserted First Amendment protected right of Mr. Jansen to have in his possession an internal church memo that he does not have to produce in court. The content of the document appears to relate to the messaging of the campaign. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Jansen is a party to litigation. The issue of his role in the campaign is very much an issue in the case. Uh, he intervened to serve as a party in the case, and I think uh, it is appropriate that the plaintiffs have sought from and obtained discovery concerning his role, and apparently his role relates to uh, his religious affiliation. I'm not aware of any privilege that attaches to that under these circumstances, and the objection will be overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. With that, I would like to publish the, um, the original version as redacted, not, not any other version, but the original version um, to the screen. Thank you. Professor Segura, uh, I'd like you to look at the f very first paragraph of this document and, and enlarge that on, on the screen so we can take a look at it. Uh, if you could read that into the record and then g give me your views on um, any sig the significance, if any, of that uh, statement to your opinions. Since the first presidency letter was read in every ward throughout California last month, I have been frequently asked what our role in public affairs will be in the Prop 8 campaign. And, and, um, and then the, the third paragraph that begins, as you know, if you could read, read that and then maybe you can talk about the significance more generally with respect to the entire document rather than going through it one by one, one paragraph by paragraph. Sure. As you know from the first presidency letter, this campaign is entirely under priesthood direction in concert with leaders of many other faiths and community groups forming part of the protectmarriage.com coalition. I believe, name redacted, will be the LDS chair for all of California with the help in Southern California from, why don't you just skip that, skip that. for now and we'll... Um, all of us working in public affairs will simply stand by and prepare to be anxiously engaged like all citizens and lay members when that time comes. And then if we jump down um, to the next, uh, the paragraph that begins, what is the next step in this campaign? Could you read, read that into the record and, and, and then tell me your views about this document? What is the next step in this campaign? I understand that all grassroots organizing efforts in OC will be led by, I believe this name is not protected? I believe that's correct. Uh, Gary Lawrence, who will <laughs> report directly to the protectmarriage.com coalition leaders. Your Honor, um, somewhat after the fact, I need to object that um, Mr. Lawrence's role in another capacity was not protected and was disclosed and has been open, open in public in this whole trial. His capacity here has been, as far as I know, protected, not disclosed, um. Well, <clears throat> recall that the Ninth Circuit. I, it, we would have been the, nice to have a chance to redact this, maybe with regard. Well, the, the Ninth Circuit pr protect, protected communications, internal communications involving the core group. Uh, this would appear to be a communication that mentions Mr. Lawrence, but it's outside a communication among the core group. So the mere fact that an individual is in the core group does not mean that his or her name cannot come out in some other way in the course of discovery. I don't disagree with that at all, Your Honor, just that individuals have privacy rights to be able to be involved in a campaign and to not have their name become part of the public record against their will in connection with things that they did not do in a public way. Oh, but Mr. Lawrence has been afforded core group protection for his internal communications. This is not one of those communications. He 
that is the actually the, the protection was Lawrence Research, the company. In the J Judge Sparrow's order of January 8, it says that the protection is given to Lor uh, is given to Lawrence Research, the company through which the campaign did polling. This is attempting to reveal, without an opportunity to redact, uh, a completely different role that he had that was not a public role. Petros? Your Honor, Mr. Lawrence's name was public. He was publicly associated with the campaign. And this paragraph talks about the fact that he's going to, be, that the effort, say, in OC, which I guess is Orange County, will be led by Gary Lawrence, who will report directly to the protectmarriage.com coalition leader. So it's talking about his role in a campaign, a public campaign, to pass a law in California. And, and the fact that religious organizations participate in the political debate is a perfectly fine thing, but once they do and they're public, there's no support for the notion that we suddenly keep people's names secret even though they're, they're associated publicly. And, and from a First Amendment perspective, probably one of the most basic principles is that once something is public, courts and, and other governmental bodies aren't allowed to keep it secret without a compelling reason. So Mr. Lawrence's name is public. He's, he's been well known to be associated with the campaign. I can't see a First Amendment interest in not noting that he was playing a principal role and a, and a liaison role here with this, this broad-based group of coalition leaders. Last word, Mr. Puno. <clears throat> Your Honor, I, I realize the nuance that his company did research and polling. He had a, a completely different hat that he wore in this campaign that was not a public hat. And if we're going to start revealing those, uh, I don't see a distinction between this and production of a list of every volunteer who helped in the campaign. Well, this individual appears not to fit the category of the famous Mrs. McIntyre, uh, who was the subject of a good deal of litigation in the Supreme Court. Uh, it's important to bear in mind this is a public campaign. This is a political campaign. It was out in the open. And the people who advocate on either side as a result of their advocacy, uh, and particularly their participation in the litigation that follows, uh, inevitably subject themselves to uh, disclosures of the kind that uh, are contained in this document. So I don't see, frankly, Mr. Puno, that there is a privilege or protection that applies to this document or that applies to Mr. Lawrence's role in this communication. An internal communication with other members of the core group is a different matter entirely. Very well. Proceed, Mr. Boutros. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and just, to, to, Professor Burr, if you could finish reading that paragraph, and then we can, we can move on to, the, to your opinions regarding this document as it relates to political power. Okay. Uh, he has also been hired by the coalition to do polling work for Prop 8. The main California grassroots leaders are in the process of being called as, quote, area directors, end quote with the responsibility for areas that generally correspond to each of the 17 LDS coordinating councils um, or the LDS mission boundaries. Thereafter, priesthood leaders will call local prop coordinators over each stake and leaders by zip code within each ward, potentially working not only with LDS but also non-LDS volunteers. In, in your opinion, Professor Segura, what, what does this document relate to in, in analyzing the degree of political power of gay and lesbians, in particularly with respect to the Prop 8 campaign? There are at least two things worthy of note. Um, the first is that there is a very close coordination uh, between uh, people involved in the church and the campaign in, from an organizational standpoint. Um, Phrases like, you know, this entire campaign is entirely under priesthood direction um, are, are notable. Um, the other thing that, that I I'm take notice of is the, is the term called. So um, it is customary uh, in uh, the practice of the LDS church for volunteers to be solicited um, through encouragement 
So it appears that there was an LDS volunteer in every zip code uh, to coordinate those activities, which is, uh, once again, a very enviable political organization. <laughs> I think uh, any political candidate would be pleased to have such a thing. Thank you. Your Honor, I, just, I wanted to make sure that um, with all the back and forth that Plaintiff's Exhibit 2554 had been admitted into evidence. It has. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Professor Segura, let's move on to exhibit, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2555. Is this a document that you have reviewed over the past week uh, in connection with your work on this case and your analysis of the issues in the case? It is. Your Honor, um, I'm, I apologize, but I must lodge another objection, and perhaps I could just lodge what will be a standing objection. Uh, the, these are the minutes of a church meeting. I cannot imagine how this is not protected from disclosure in a federal court trial, especially, uh, I, I, Your Honor, this has got to be protected information. Well, I think we need a foundation for this document. I will, I will establish one, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Professor Segura, um, did you, you review this document and did it shed any light on your analysis of uh, political power? Well, is this witness able to lay a foundation for the document? Um, this witness can, can testify that this was a document we represented to him was produced by proponents in this case pursuant to the production order and that he reviewed it and that it's relevant to his opinion. And your representation is uh, from what source did the document come? This, um, this document was produced by the defendant interveners in response to our request for production um, after they began to comply with Judge Sparrow's order rejecting their First Amendment claim. And, and so I think it falls into the same category as the last document, 2554. It does appear to be the minutes of a uh, stake meeting. Um, I gather, Mr. Puno, it is correct that this is a document that came from the files of protectmarriage.com or one of the individual intervener defendants? Uh, I can say, Your Honor, it was one or the other. I'm not certain what right. I suspect it was. Well, if it is, in fact, what it appears to be, and that is minutes of, of a stake meeting, but it was nonetheless in the files of an organization other than the religious organization, I can't see how it would enjoy any <clears throat> religious institution privilege if there is one. Your Honor, just to clarify, I'm almost certain this came from Mr. Jansen's file. Um, as far as the named defendant intervenors. I'm, he's the only one that I'm aware of that is a member of the LDS Church. These are the minutes of a meeting of church members and officials. And the fact that it was in Mr. Jansen's possession, I cannot imagine abrogates the privilege to be able to... There really is no First Amendment protection here, Your Honor, if having a copy of your correspondence with other members of your church in your possession becomes, uh, abrogates, abrogates your First Amendment rights. Well, it's rather like the attorney-client privilege. Confidentiality must be maintained, and it appears that that was not uh, done in connection with this document. Uh, Mr. Jansen may have had multiple roles, but his role here is his role in campaign. And this document apparently relates to that activity. Your Honor, there's no evidence here that this was sent to anyone by Mr. Jansen. This is in Mr. Jansen's shoebox under his bed. This is the minutes of a meeting that I don't, I don't even, I haven't looked to see whether he was in attendance at the meeting. I, but the, but this, I know that he was a, a public affairs official at the time. Uh, of the campaign, but my, my point is is that this Mr. Jansen did not send this anybody. The only reason this is here is because a federal court order told him to, to take it out of his shoebox and bring it into court. Shoebox? <laughs> <laughs> it illustrates the point, Your Honor. He did not send this to his neighbors. This is, these are his private records of his private political religious associations. How in the world can that be compelled to be brought into court and laid bare 
uh, in the public record. This appears to relate to the Prop 8 campaign. It clearly relates to this religious denomination's public affairs meeting, part of which included a discussion of a ballot measure and the efforts of their members in which anyone on either side of the issue has a, a fundamental right to associate with others, including in their religious organization. Of course, uh, of course, no one is questioning the fundamental right of association. No one's questioning the right of Mr. Jansen to participate in the political campaign. But that does not afford a right against the disclosure of his role, what he did. Well, Your Honor, then I would... And, uh, there, I would suggest that unless there is something in this document for which a foundation can be laid that he had anything to do with the matters discussed in here, then I, th I have to object on a lack of foundation. I think I can lay that foundation, Your Honor. I beg your pardon? I think I can lay that foundation. All right. On page um, 10685, which would be the second page, and this, this is really the, the, the paragraph that begins <coughs> legislative update. Yes. That's really the, the, the remaining portion of this document I think we could probably redact even more if it goes into the record. But this is the key part, the part that says, Mark Jansen reported on the California Constitutional Amend Prop Amendment Proposition 8. Then it goes on to describe the public activities with protectmarriage.com, this broad-based coalition. That's really what I would like to direct the witnesses' attention to. And um, Very well. The objection will be overruled and 2555 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Please publish Plaintiff's Exhibit 2555, but let's focus on, uh, if we can go right to page 10685, the paragraph that is entitled Legislative Update. <coughs> uh, and, and actually, if you could put the, the paragraph that follows that as well. And while that's happening, Professor Segura, give me your impression as to what this document, this portion of the document relating to legislative update uh, uh, is doing in terms of this memorandum. As I read it, Mr. Jansen is um, reiterating the strategy that's to be employed with how um, church leaders and church members should present themselves with respect to the Proposition 8 campaign. And, and what what is it about this document that leads you to that conclusion? Um, particularly um, the first two sentences of the second paragraph. Quote, Brother Jansen emphasized that we are not to take the lead on this proposition, but to join in coalition with protectmarriage.com. Salt Lake City conducted a teleconference with 159 of 161 stake presidents in the state of California and told the presidents LDS are involved in this issue, but are not to take the lead. Teach youth and young adults the doctrine of marriage by using the, I assume that's letter, read in sacrament meetings. And LDS are encouraged to contribute the fundraising, uh, $30 suggested donation. Brother Jansen announced that $5 million is the projected goal. In addition to general fundraising, donations are best provided to protectmarriage.com. And if we could turn to the next page, 10686, which is the, the stamped number on the bottom of the page, the, the paragraph begins, we were, we were asked. If, I'd like to fo focus you on the first and the last sentence of that paragraph and, and then tell me your views on the connection between this document and political power. We were asked to wait patiently for talking points from the coalition. And how about the last sentence? Director Holland highlighted the luxury of having Mark Jansen on key committees and that he will receive direct communications, I assume, from him. As a political scientist, um, what is it about this document and, and these statements that is relevant to analyzing the, the balance of political power between gay men and lesbians and religious organizations to the extent they're involved in political activities in California? Well, with respect to the Proposition 8 campaign, it makes it clear that there was a, a sort of two-way flow of information where um, uh, strategic talking points were being provided to religious leaders by the campaign and in turn uh, the religious leaders were providing volunteers to the campaign 
Um, but there was this cautious, strategic, not to take the lead um, notion uh, so as to provide a, uh, a, I don't know, plausible deniability or respectable distance between the church organization per se and the actual campaign. And does that have an impact on how the power of gay and lesbians is viewed you know, by public officials and in the public, that kind of approach to political advocacy? Well, well, certainly, because as we're looking uh, at the political opportunity structure, sort of how fertile the ground is for political action and how strong your opponents might be, um, we might look at um, the religious belief as a source of opposition to homosexuality and say some number of religious adherents went out and voted their, their, their uh, beliefs on election day and, and think that that's, in fact, kind of the end of it, but in fact it, this appears to suggest fairly, fairly close coordination between hierarchy and officials within church organizations, as in some of the past documents have, have illustrated, and the leaders of the ballot initiative. Have, have you ever, in your studies, in your review of the literature, in your analysis of political activity in the United States, ever seen um, this kind of structure constructed and deployed in an effort to eliminate a fundamental state constitutional right of a minority group? Uh, this is new in my experience. Let's, let's jump ahead to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2557. Okay. Honor, I need to lodge an <coughs> objection to the use of this document. Again, it is under attorney's eyes only uh, confidential privilege. Um, this is a post-election document, and it refers to activities and financial activities uh, post-election. And uh, relevance is a problem, uh, and it, <laughs> to the extent this reveals confidential um, inner workings of, of uh, relationships between organizations that supported Prop 8. Um, this is highly, highly uh, revealing and, and, and confidential, and we object. Well, not to make light of that, um, usually why people want to introduce documents is because they are revealing. <laughs> um, but it does appear that this is a communication amongst uh, individuals who are part of the core group. Is that not correct, Mr. Uh, Boutros? It's a communication from someone outside the core group to people who are in the core group, which... Oh, I, I see. Yes. I see. The from the, line. Uh, the from line. And, and, Your Honor, the foundation, there's no question this is an authentic document. It was sent to... The, you know, the, the entire, basically the entire executive committee, Mr. Delesse, Mr. Puno himself, Mr. Jansen, Mr. Schubert, who is the political consultant, Jeff Flint, another political consultant, and it, it um, and they are all copied on it. And, and the reason that it's relevant, without disclosing the full contents, is that it really shows the degree of connection between protectmarriage.com and the organization that sent this document in terms of the funding. And um, the protectmarriage.com in this court, for your honor, and in the depositions, and in other contexts, have taken the position that these other organizations were uh, not really that connected to protectmarriage.com and the official campaign. This document goes directly to that, and as relevant to Professor Segura's testimony, demonstrates this um, significant broad coalition that was connected by not only the same views about Proposition 8, but by an incredible fundraising uh, mechanism and relationships. And so I think it's, it's directly relevant. It was produced by proponents of Proposition 8, and it's, it, it includes you know, the people outside the core group, so I think it should, it, it should be admitted. Your Honor, maybe we can confirm the sender. Uh, if I could see an unredacted copy of this. Uh, I can show you that right now. I, Your Honor, I could. Sure. That. Okay. 
Your Honor, uh, the sender is a person identified in Judge Sparrow's order of January 8 as a member of the core group. Otherwise, we'll just state our continuing objection. And he was identified as part of the core group? Yes. The well, sender? He was under seal, and he was, he was identified by, the, uh, by Judge Sparrow by reference to paragraph and line number as a member of the core group. Not by his name doesn't appear in the order. It refers to a sealed declaration. Bless me. <laughs> uh, there are six members is, of the it, core. Did, did Spiro include this individual as a member of the core group? Yes, Your Honor. That one, Your Honor, I, I don't. There, there is, I think, one maybe a core group member or two that I don't even know about. But I would suggest there. This John Doe. Not your honor. Well, <laughs> th th this morning's John Doe. <laughs> <laughs> when, when John the, Doe one, John Doe two. Is <laughs> there were, um, I believe, your honor, that there were as many as six <laughs> individuals. How many? As many as six individuals that were identified to Judge Sparrow by John Doe one, John Doe two, or something of, in that nature, uh, under a sealed declaration, and. The order which lists the members of the core group uh, includes those six individuals, and that is the individual who sent this communication. Well, my inclination is to do this. I'm not sure I follow the John Doe business. <laughs> um, but accepting counsel's representation that the sender is a member of the core group, the document is a post-election document. The document is being offered to establish a connection between the religious organization and the campaign, that being a subject that I think, Mr. Boutros, you have um, pursued and have introduced significant evidence on. So I will sustain an objection basically on cumulative grounds. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I just have a couple more documents here, Your Honor, that um, I think the next document, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2561, this is one to which there's no objection, I'm pleased to announce. And Professor Segura, is this a document that you have reviewed? It is. And um, did, did, it, uh, did you consider informing your opinions, the opinions that you're giving here today? I did. Your Honor, I move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 2561. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. <laughs> Music to my ears. <laughs> that was refreshing. Um, if we could publish Plaintiff's 2561, uh, please. Professor Segura, briefly, um, what is it about this document that reflects on political power in your view? Going to the heart of the matter, the last sentence of the first paragraph uh, reads, quote, you may know that the Mormons have been out walking neighborhoods the past two Saturdays with about 20,000 total volunteers. And why is that important in evaluating political power in this context? Again, I, I would um, suggest that any political consultant would be thrilled to have 20,000 precinct walkers on any given Saturday. Uh, so I think it, it speaks to the, the breadth and size of the opposition to gay and lesbian interests. Please turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2562. Is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2562 a document you reviewed over the last week in connection with your testimony? It is. Your Honor, I move admission of this document, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2562. It's another document that was produced by the proponents over the last week. No objection, Your Honor. Our standing objections, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Very well. Please publish this exhibit, and I'd like to direct the witness just to expedite things to page the second page. Well, actually, let me ask you. The, go, go to the first page. What is this document, Professor, in, in your understanding? If you could describe it. Um, it appears to be uh, uh, an email from the chair of protectmarriage.com uh, uh, to others dealing with um, some issue regarding how designated gifts take place um, to the campaign. 
then let's go to the next page. And um, are there, is there anything on this page that caught your eye as you evaluated the issue of political power? There are three things. Uh, the first would be everything under uh, the, the numeral one. What, and what is it about that portion of the document that's relevant to what you're talking about today? Numeral one recounts the um, early organizational efforts uh, largely among evangelicals to get uh, church leadership involved in the campaign and reports that in these very, very large teleconferences when um, sort of message, um, the message that the campaign wanted to send through the, the, the pulpit was, was discussed, there were 1,700 participants in June and 3,000 participants in July uh, of 2008. And the third bullet point suggests that uh, their goal was to have as many as 5,000 California pastors participate in one of these calls. Thank you. And finally, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2598. Please turn to that exhibit. And, Your Honor, in conversations with Mr. Pooney, there are a couple of names there's in this that I'm happy to redact that we missed. I will refrain from publishing them. Uh, but other than that, um, I don't believe there's an objection to this document and would move its admission. It's another one, a document produced by the proponents. Subject to the redaction, no objection, Your Honor. Well, and I think I'm... I'm is admitted. Yes, th go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Professor Segura, I think I, since there's this redaction issue, I'm not going to put this up on the screen. But what was it about, what is this document and what what is it about it that sheds light, in your view, on the political power issue. It appears to be a fundraising letter. Um, and it's to someone who has um, given generously to the Family Research Council in the past. And the reason I found it interesting was it, it suggests a, um, a coordination of potential donor bases, a sort of sharing of um, sort of people with capacity as as endowment folks like to say, um, who, are, who are potentially able to give. In that regard, could you turn to the very last page, which is stamp 009699. The, the, at the top of the page, the sentence that begins, we have the. Yes. Could you read that and then give me your, your impressions on, on that in, in terms of political power? We have the political and financial support of groups such as Focus on the Family, Family Research Council, American Family Association, the Arlington Group, and many others. And are those significant groups in terms of political power in the United States when banded together? Um, separately and together, each of them are a fairly um, uh, powerful uh, interest group representing the evangelical movement in, in national politics. Based on the factors that you've described today, um, as well as the manifestations that you described earlier this morning relating to political powerlessness, what is your opinion regarding the political powerlessness of gay men and lesbians in the United States and in California? My opinion is that when we take together um, the moments of legislative victory, uh, the moments of legislative defeat, uh, the presence of ballot initiatives, um, the absence of statutory or constitutional protection, the presence of statutory or constitutional disadvantage, and um, a, a host of, of circumstances including um, small numbers, public hostility, hostility of elected officials, and a clearly well-integrated, nationally prominent organized opposition I conclude that gays and lesbians lack the sufficient power necessary to protect themselves in the political system. Now I have two principal lines of questioning for you as we, we finish things off here. The first is, I would like you to explain um, whether you conducted any comparison with the political power of gay men and lesbians with other, other groups in society including women, African-Americans. I did. Um, what were your conclusions regarding the comparison in terms of the relative political power between gay men and lesbians on the one hand and women in the 1970s, for example? 
So um, I can, I, I'll begin with the conclusion. I concluded that uh, relative to the position of women in the early 1970s, gay men and lesbians are more disadvantaged today than women were in the 1970s. Uh, for starters, women constitute, constituted then and constitute today a majority of the population. And were they so motivated, they could determine most, if not all, political outcomes. Um, second, uh, while there was certainly sexism, and I wouldn't want to you know, understate the importance of that historically, um, being a woman is not inherently controversial. Families don't hate their daughters. Uh, um, in, in fact, women are quite beloved uh, by many, many people. Um, third, uh, there were women in public office. <laughs> Some of whom are men, some of whom are women. Uh, um, there were women in public office, but, but perhaps most importantly, there was already statutory protection. The 1963 Equal Pay Act, certain provisions of the 1964 Civil Rights Act clearly protected women uh, at the federal level. So in addition to having more political power, more votes, less or no hostility, uh, there is also the matter that they enjoyed statutory protection. What were your conclusions regarding the relative political power uh, between uh, gay, and gay men and lesbians on the one hand and, and African Americans on the other hand before the Civil Rights Act of 1964? This is a, this is a comparison uh, which is a little bit more complex to explain. So I would want to try to separate out the political circumstances on the one hand from the social and economic circumstances on the other. Let me begin by saying that being an African American prior to the enactment of civil rights legislation was a very difficult thing to do in this country and uh, the quality of life and the day-to-day -day experiences of African Americans, particularly in the South, uh, is something that we should take quite seriously uh, as, as historically quite, quite damaging. Uh, that notwithstanding, I would, I would turn my focus to the political circumstances, which is what I was asked to evaluate. Um, at the time that suspect classification was extended to cover <coughs> racial and ethnic minorities, there were three amendments to the United States Constitution that formally established um, civil equality for racial and ethnic minorities. Admittedly, these were not enforced. Admittedly, there was all sorts of statutory nonsense that took place in the wake uh, of those amendments, but the establishment at the constitutional level of equality was complete. Um, there were any number of statutes that had taken place to protect the interest of African Americans. All of the New Deal legislation, for example, ex was explicitly race neutral and made a point of, of making it clear that African Americans were entitled to uh, the, the activities of, of the New Deal. Um, immediately prior to the Second World War, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8803, uh, which prohibited uh, the uh, government contracting, the War Department especially, with any business that was engaged in discriminatory practices against African Americans. Uh, and of course, the government is the largest single purchaser of all products in the society, so that had a, a, a fairly substantial ripple effect in the manufacturing sector. Uh, and in 1948, President Truman desegregated the United States military. So again, I, I think it would be fair to say that socio socioeconomic conditions were very bad for African Americans in the middle part of the 20th century. But there were a number of instances of statutory protection and even constitutionally established equality um, that African Americans enjoyed, and at that point, it was the, the the civil rights movement was an effort to bring the social reality in consonance with the constitutional uh, establishment. By contrast, gays and lesbians are in a different position, so they're they're subject to statutory disadvantage. Um, some would suggest that gays and lesbians aren't as oppressed as African Americans were, and there there might be. A uh, good reason to suggest that that's true, at least for some gays and lesbians in, in, in more open social environments. But the, uh, the arrow's moving in the opposite direction. So in 1990, there was not a single constitutional establishment 
of inequality for gays and lesbians, and today there are, in about three-fifths of the states, there is constitutionally established inequality. So as a constitutional matter, gays and lesbians were moving in the opposite direction that African Americans were in the 1940s. How about group size in terms of African Americans and gay men and lesbians in terms of populating jurisdictions? So um, African Americans in the 1940s were approximately 10 or 11 percent of the national population. Um, the, today that number is closer to 13 percent. Um, that varies quite widely by jurisdiction. There are a number of southern states where the black population is well north of 30 percent, in some cases uh, around 40 percent. Um, certainly many cities in which African Americans are a majority of the population. Um, by contrast, there is no jurisdiction with which I'm familiar. There might be a, you know, a small resort town here or there, but, the, but there's no jurisdiction of any size with which I'm familiar that has a gay majority. Bringing us forward to today, are there, out of the manifestations of political powerlessness of African Americans compared to the manifestations of political powerlessness of gay men and lesbians? So thinking a little bit more broadly about the subject matter of race and ethnicity, there are now 69 persons of color serving in the House of Representatives. Um, there have been as many as four senators. Uh, that's not the case right now. That some people left to join the administration. Um, and uh, so obviously that compares favorably to the six um, gay and lesbians who've ever served and the three who currently serve in the House of Representatives. Um, minorities are elected to public office in many parts of the United States. The 1965 Voting Rights Act, and particularly the judicial implementation of Section 2 as it was amended in 1982, have provided numerous opportunities for persons of color to elect um, their members of their community to public office, um, and, and in fact have even been an in interpreted uh, as an affirmative responsibility, particularly under Section 5 covered jurisdictions, that they have to provide opportunities for racial and ethnic minorities to vote for first choice candidates. How about the presidency? Oh yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> we do have our first Hawaiian president. Um, <laughs> But, but obviously the election of an African American to the presidency is a big deal. I, I, would, I would also go so far as to say, however, and I, I, I don't want to um, provide the impression that I don't think African Americans uh, and the category of race and ethnicity isn't still of significant concern in, in our society, and indeed a significant portion of my scholarship addresses that, just that in, in terms of political power today, um, compared to gay and lesbians, they're doing quite well. Finally, I would like to display demonstrative number eight and ask Professor Segura whether you have any opinions regarding the deposition and report and opinions expressed by proponents, proffered expert on political power, Dr. Miller. So um, I do. Um, witness has not put in any report uh, that addresses uh, Professor Miller's analysis, and we haven't had an opportunity to depose him on it. Well, <coughs> I assume, Mr. Boutros, you had <coughs> the witness read uh, Mr. Miller's deposition. He attended it, Your Honor. He attended? Yes. Section overrule. Professor Sugar, if you could give us uh, kind of the broad outlines of your critique of, um, of Dr. Miller's opinions and approach. Sure. Uh, Professor Miller approached the question of political power of gays and lesbians somewhat differently than I did. Um, and in his deposition, um, a number of things became clear about both his analytical structure and the breadth of the information that he considered. Um, the first point um, is that Professor Miller uh, frankly doesn't know anything about gay and lesbian politics. Um, during the course of his deposition, he could not identify um, many of the critical historical figures in uh, the early part of the movement, was not familiar with um, political science work, including very prominent political science work that had focused on gays and lesbians. He was aware of some judicial scholarship on gays and lesbians because um, 
that is is his field of endeavor. Um, but uh, even there, wasn't familiar with uh, some of the key pieces on on how political science would would address uh, gays and lesbians. It was also curious that he was unfamiliar at all with the political science work on prejudice, of which there is an enormous amount, and and uh, and of which was well known. How about so, his? Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. How about his knowledge concerning the presence or absence of legal protections relating to gay men and lesbians? Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Professor Miller did not look beyond the boundaries of California. Uh, he focused exclusively on California statute, and when he was asked about other states, he had almost no answer for anything, and, and in fact, even proceeded to suggest that he would be shocked if it were the case that a majority of the states have no legal protections for gays and lesbians, which of course is the case. When asked how many of the top 10 states don't have any protection, he, he didn't know the answer. With respect to uh, the protections that have been passed in California, he actually didn't really know the legislative history of most of those as well. Um, so it, 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 was, it was really quite striking uh, how little information he had on this. To put it in, in starkest terms, in 29 states, there is no anti-discrimination protection for gays and lesbians. And Professor Miller concluded that gays and lesbians po uh, possess political power without being aware of that, not that fact. Did you agree with Professor uh, Miller's definition of political power as he applied it in reaching his opinions? There, there were a couple of problems with um, Miller's definition of power. Uh, first, what there was of a definition was actually quite vague, and he was asked about it in deposition. He arrived at a definition that said that a group had political power if they received a fair hearing from the lawmakers. But um, he, there was no investigation in his report as to whether or not gays and lesbians had, in fact, received a fair hearing from the lawmakers. And of course, this is an initiative process, so who are the lawmakers? The lawmakers are the proponents of the ballot initiative and the voters. Um, so in the absence of any investigation, I don't understand how, even under his definition, he could conclude that the threshold for political power had been met. But in the case of the statutory enactments where he wanted to say, well, these, these um, pieces of legislation constituted evidence of political power. Some of those pieces of legislation were actually pursuant to court cases, um, that decisions that had already been handed down. And the attorney deposing him actually asked him, um, so are, are favorable court decisions an element of political power? And he said, yes. Well, judicial intervention on on behalf of insular minorities cannot be considered an element of political power in a fair sense if the measure of political power is what we're using to decide whether or not judicial intervention is appropriate. Finally, uh, Professor Segura, how did Dr. Miller's testimony and report square with his own writings regarding ballot initiatives? Professor Miller's scholarship focuses on how the judiciary has reacted to ballot initiatives, and so he spent a, a fair amount of time researching those. Um, in his actual published research, he has suggested first that um, ballot initiatives are very likely to result in bad law because they're not as deliberative as the legislative process, and that ballot initiatives frequently target minorities. And on both of those things, I'm highly inclined to agree with him. No further questions, Your Honor. Very well, <coughs> very well. Mr. Thompson, you may cross-examine. Good afternoon, uh, Professor. Mr. Thompson. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, now, uh, of the 10 largest cities in the United States, how many of them have protections for against discrimination against gays and lesbians? Do you know? Um, I, I, I don't have an encyclopedic uh, knowledge of that, but I would suspect the number is probably in the eight or nine range, that it's quite common. Municipal enactments, of course, have limitations, but 
Now, uh, you live in California, is that correct? I do. Okay. And you donated money to the No on 8 campaign, is that correct? I did. And do you recall that about eight days after the Prop 8 campaign, you participated in a panel discussion at Stanford with Simon Jackson? Uh, Simon Jackman. Jackman. I participated in a course lecture with Simon Jackman. Okay, and do you recall that the subject of Prop 8 came up during that discussion? It, it certainly did. A and do you recall uh, your colleague uh, saying that you felt very strongly about Prop 8? Um, I don't remember exactly what he said. I'm, I don't have it committed to memory. It wouldn't surprise me. Okay, you do feel very strongly about Prop 8, don't you? <clears throat> I believe in the equality of persons under the law. And as a consequence, the constitutional establishment of inequality is something I find deeply offensive. And um, I'd like to uh, nail down some uh, terms that you use during your direct. Um, when an individual answering a poll is about asked about gays or lesbians, a variety of things might enter their mind. Is that correct? Uh, presumably, yes. It might mean sexual conduct to some, correct? It may. Or it could be some sort of behavioral trappings of what the person might stereotypically believe to be gay or lesbian, correct? It may. Or it may actually be associated with an individual person, a member of the family or coworker, correct? That's correct. It is really hard to say what jumps into someone's mind when they hear the term gay or lesbian, correct? Um, hard to say in the sense that there's more than one notion that could enter their mind. Uh, we could define the universe of likely items that would be considered by a respondent. So that's not particularly hard to say. But to ask what any individual is thinking of when he, he or she answers the question, it could be a, a fairly um, limited set of options. All right. And now let's talk about the definition of political power. The exercise of power, in your opinion, is moving someone from opposition or fence sitting into your own column, correct? Um, that would be part of it. Um, another possibility would be uh, persuading them to stand down, to, to no longer oppose, even if they themselves haven't changed their opinion. Um, or it may be mustering the political forces necessary to circumvent them. And under your definition of power, if the group had power, it would be able to cajole or compel members of the legislature to produce an outcome that they may not have been predisposed to produce, correct? Um, that would be part of it. Uh, I would also want to be concerned about secure. So um, it's not just achieving an outcome, but sort of securing it from likely reversal. And you believe that gays and lesbians have to rely almost exclusively on allies who are regularly shown to be insufficiently strong or reliable to achieve or protect their interests, correct? I believe as a general proposition that that's true, that there, there are allies, even reliable allies, but that if we looked across the universe of potential allies, that the number of allies is smaller than is necessary and that many of those allies are unreliable. And applying your definition of political power, you believe the NAACP had a meaningful degree of political power even when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House, correct? Uh, I think it is the case that they had less power when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker than when the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives, but even under those circumstances, I would say that they had a fair degree of, of influence. All right, uh, Your Honor, uh, we'd like to pass out some binders, if we may. Very well. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I wondered where the binders were. I approach Your Honor. Thank you. And, uh, Professor, I'd like to direct your attention to tab seven.
And uh, in particular, th this is the uh, 2007 annual report of the Human Rights Campaign. It's DIX 1330. And, and the Human Rights Campaign is a leading gay rights advocacy group, is that correct? That's correct. And I'd like to direct your attention to uh, page four of this document. It's actually the sixth page of the exhibit. It has a little four in the bottom left-hand column. And there. Okay, and directing your attention to the third paragraph, it says in the second sentence, we were named by the well-respected National Journal the single most effective non-union progressive organization working in the 2006 midterm elections. Using your definition of political power, do you think the human rights campaign had a meaningful degree of political power in the 2006 midterm elections? I do not. Right. And in the next sentence, uh, the annual report says, we played a decisive role in electing fair-minded majorities to the U.S. House and Senate and to legislatures from Oregon to New Hampshire. But using your definition of political power, you don't believe the human rights campaign has a meaningful degree of political power, correct? No. And in California, uh, the incoming speaker uh, is John Perez. Is that correct? That's of the correct. assembly? Yes. I think and he's already taken office, hasn't he? He may have actually. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and uh, Mr. Perez is openly gay, is that correct? That's my understanding. And he was unanimously elected to the speakership of the California Assembly, is that correct, by the Democratic Caucus? Um, after the alternative candidates withdrew, yes. And, uh, but under your definition of political power, gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in the California Assembly, even though the speaker is openly gay, correct? That's correct, because again, outcome does not reveal process. Applying your definition of political power, biblical literalists have more political power in the California legislature than the gay and lesbian community, correct? If we looked at their representation among the elected officials, that would be my conclusion. And if we look at outcomes, would that be your conclusion as well? Again, outcomes are a particularly difficult thing to uh, rely upon because we have to understand how the outcome came about. Well, if we look at domestic partnerships, uh, the gay and lesbian community supported those in 1999 in California, correct? That would be my assumption, yes. And the biblical literalists opposed it, correct? That's correct. The gay and lesbian community won that fight, correct? Again, process matters, but yes, the answer to that is, is it, that is correct. Okay, and then in 2003, there was an expansion of the domestic partnership law in California, correct? That's what I understand. And the gay and lesbian community supported that expansion, correct? I'm sure they did. And the biblical literalists opposed it, correct? I would assume. And even though the gay and lesbian community won that fight, you say they have less power in the California legislature than biblical literalists, correct? I say that they have less power in the California legislature because they're less represented. Their representation is augmented by Democratic control. Should there be Republican control, they would have no power whatsoever. If a, a group is successful in getting legal protections against discrimination aimed at that group, that would be a positive factor that you would weigh in assessing political power, correct? It would be a positive factor with the consideration that the discrimination exists in the first place. And, and gays and lesbians in California have many legal protections against discrimination, correct? Um, I'm sorry, many? You, I, I don't understand. You'd have to be specific about what that term means. Well, haven't there been over 50 pieces of legislation over the last 10 years that have sought to protect the legal rights of gays and lesbians in California? I don't think it would be a fair statement to say that in 50 cases the interest of gays and lesbians were codified into law. I think it would be fair to say that there are anti-discrimination lines in at least 50 pieces of legislation. Now you are correct that some of those pieces of legislation did in fact grant protection from discrimination to gays and lesbians 
And as I indicated in my direct, some of that was in response to court decisions. Can you identify any state in the union that has more legal protections for gays and lesbians than California? I cannot. Um, using your definition of political power, can you give any examples of the Hispanic community in Congress uh, exercising political power during the last 10 years? Um, well, um, I could think of the role they may have played in um, attempting to stop immigration legislation when the, minor when the current minority was the majority. Uh, they certainly played a role in rallying forces to stop the uh, attempt to criminalize um, the presence in the United States of undocumented persons. That would be an example. Any other examples? Um, I'm sure if I thought for a while I could. Uh, now, in New Hampshire, gays and lesbians have secured, through the legislative process, the right to same-sex marriage, correct? That's my understanding, yes. But using your definition of political power, your initial reaction would be that gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in New Hampshire, correct? Um, that would be my initial reaction because I would need to understand the legislative history and the legislative circumstances surrounding the enactment of that protection. I'd also want to know whether or not that protection is likely to be subject to reversal. And so do you have an opinion on whether gays and lesbians in New Hampshire have a meaningful degree of political power? I don't have sufficient information on my hand to, to, to answer that. And in Vermont, gays and lesbians have secured through the legislative process the right to same-sex marriage, correct? <coughs> um, again, I'm uncomfortable with this, no this notion that gays and lesbians have secured. The Vermont legislature has, in fact, passed same-sex marriage legislation. That's my understanding. At the urging of the gay and lesbian community? Well, certainly not with their opposition, but they weren't in a position to compel the legislature to do so, but certainly they asked. But using your definition of political power, you would suggest that gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in Vermont, correct? Again, it would be difficult for me to make a, a full fulling statement about the circumstances in Vermont without knowing the legislative history and the circumstances of gays and lesbians in the various state and county governments. I also want to reiterate that my understanding of political power is very nationally oriented. That is that those gays and lesbians newly enfranchised with the right to marry in New Hampshire and Vermont don't have those marriages recognized by the federal government, nor can the domestic partners registered in California visit ill domestic partners in Nevada or Louisiana, there's no guarantee that those rights are accepted. So we need to think of this not solely on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, but also across layers of government. Well, is, it our jur is a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis irrelevant to your analysis? Not irrelevant, but we certainly would have considered both. Okay. Now, gays and lesbians have the right to marry in Massachusetts, correct? That is correct. And gays and lesbians were able to defeat an effort to restore the traditional definition of marriage in Massachusetts, correct? Um, defeat is an interesting term. My understanding was that in the legislature there was some maneuvering to prevent it from coming up for a vote. I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't have an exhaustive command of the Massachusetts legislature. And at present in Massachusetts there is no effort to repeal same-sex marriage because any such effort would be futile, correct? Um, Again, I don't know if I could conclude that. I would think as long as the uh, Democrats retain, retain the majority in the Commonwealth's lower house, that it would be difficult to do that. But, but I, I, I can't say for sure that there would be none. But using your definition of political power, gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in Massachusetts, correct? To the extent that they, mustering their own resources, cannot defend their basic rights and that those rights do not travel with them across state lines. No, they do not. And uh, would the same answer obtain for Connecticut that even though they're same-sex marriage, under your definition, uh, gays and lesbians do not have a ma meaningful degree of political power in Connecticut? And Iowa. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In Washington, D.C., the D.C. City Councils passed a bill that would legalize same-sex marriage in the District of Columbia, correct? Uh, that's my understanding. But using your definition of political power, gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in Washington, D.C., correct? Again, thinking of the context moving across levels of government, I would say that no gay and lesbian in the United States enjoys a meaningful degree of political power. 
And, and in Houston, where there's an openly uh, lesbian mayor, uh, your opinion would be that there's not a meaningful degree of political power in Houston for gays and lesbians, is that correct? Nor are there even domestic partner benefits for city employees, so that is correct. Now, um, Mayor Sanders uh, has testified that two out of the eight city council members in San Diego are openly gay. Are you aware of that? I am. And uh, Mayor Sanders himself is an ally of the LGBT community, correct? Um, I would say that he is today, yes. Uh, and using your definition of uh, political power, gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in San Diego, correct? Um, that is correct, because gays and lesbians in San Diego, um, in two ways, gays and lesbians in San Diego remain constitutionally established as second-class citizens. And, uh, as Mayor Sanders testified, uh, the gay and lesbian um, group in San Diego is not sufficiently powerful to, to prompt fear or uh, any sort of compliance from its legislators. And uh, turning your attention to uh, tab 15, please, in your binder. This is a uh, New York Times. Oh, and, and by the way, Your Honor, I believe I neglected to uh, request permission to move into evidence DIX 1330, which is the Human Rights Campaign Annual Report of 2007. Very well, 1330 is admitted. And uh, turning your attention to tab 15 in your binder, Professor, um, it's DIX 2554. This is a New York Times article entitled, Gay Candidates Get Support That Causes May Not. Uh, and it's dated December 28, 2009. And in the fifth paragraph, it states, there are currently at least 445 openly gay and lesbian people holding elected office in the United States, up from 257 eight years ago. And are those numbers accurate to the best of your knowledge? I have no basis on which to evaluate them. I have no reason to believe that they're inaccurate. Didn't you have numbers like that in your opening report? I did, but my numbers were disaggregated by level of government. Um, and uh, turning to uh, the uh, third paragraph from the bottom, it talks about uh, Charles Pugh, an openly gay former broadcaster swept to victory as city council president in Detroit in his first bid for public office. Using your definition of political power, gays and lesbians do not have a meaningful degree of political power in Detroit, even though the president of the city council is openly gay, correct? Uh, that would be correct because I would look at the preferences of the remaining members of the city council, the attitudes of the state of Michigan's legislature, the absence of any form of non-discrimination legislation in, in Michigan, and the absence of protective legislation at the federal level. So residents of the city of Detroit reside not just in Detroit, but in Wayne County, in Michigan, in the United States. Now, if we turn to the second page of this article, which is actually the third page behind the, the tab, uh, we can see that uh, in the uh, seventh paragraph, it starts in Troit. Yes. It says, in Detroit, Mr. Pugh's sexuality never became an issue in his race for city council. Quote, I thought I would be attacked during the campaign for being gay, close quote. He said in an interview, I wasn't. It was a pleasant surprise. Isn't it true that in many big cities, it's increasingly irrelevant whether a candidate is gay or lesbian? I think that would depend on which big city. So I would, I would respond to this in, in two ways. First, the candidate did expect to be attacked for his sexuality. And second, in the previous example you mentioned in the city of Houston, uh, her sexuality was very much at issue. Her opponent used it to try to diminish her support. Uh, so I don't think it is the case that um, being gay or lesbian is a footnote of no interest to voters in many big cities. There are certainly big cities where it is less important than it might previously have been or than in other cities. 
but I don't think it's fair to say that it is an insignificant uh, element of a candidate's identities today. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2554. I'm, just, I'm just going to object on, on hearsay grounds. I have no objection to it coming into the fact of the article, but not for the truth of the matter asserted. Your Honor, it relates to a legislative fact. We've had also. Uh, I think the witness has opened the door to this. Uh, 2554 will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, turning uh, your attention, uh, Professor, to uh, tab 16. This is a uh, story in the Atlanta Journal Constitution dated October 10th, 2009. It's entitled, Gay Votes Can Make a Difference. And uh, it's an interview with Jeff Graham, the executive director of Georgia Equality, one of the largest gay advocacy and lobbying groups in the state. And if you turn your attention to the fourth paragraph from the bottom, um, he provides the following answer to a question, quote, I think we've certainly seen in the last 20 years that I've lived here there have been a number of close elections in runoff scenarios when both the winners and the losers have conceded that strength of the LGBT vote was a deciding factor in those races. When you have a voting history that goes back 20 years or more, the political establishment begins to realize that it actually is a vote that can make a difference. But using your definition of political power, gays and lesbians don't have a meaningful degree of political power in Atlanta, correct? That's correct, and I'd actually go on to suggest that uh, there are a number of problems with the claims being made here. The first problem is that this claim is being made by an advocate for a gay and lesbian action organization. Not surprisingly, as you can imagine yourself, advocates for organizations want to present the power of their organization in the most po positive light because their job is to raise money and to mobilize forces on behalf of the group. People historically don't give money to the donate to us, we're very unlikely to make a difference. Um, <laughs> so as a, so the, the strategy that, that he would use, and indeed any advocate would use, would be to, um, to overstate, to the extent possible, the political influence you have. Now I actually know a little bit about Atlanta. So Atlanta, of course, was one of the locations where there were uh, violent attacks on a gay bar by uh, an individual who was subsequently um, identified as potentially involved in the Olympics bombing, you'll all recall. I also know that Georgia is one of the top 10 states that does not have uh, an anti-discrimination provision in its state statute. So I don't think we can look at the certainly well-intended boast of a political advocate and conclude that this is a convincing analysis of the political circumstances in the city of Atlanta's politics. Well, isn't it true that in the most recent runoff for mayor, both candidates were actively seeking the vote of the LGBT community? That may well be the case. It still doesn't mean that the group is determinative of the outcome or that they have particular important uh, in input on matters of city policy. Uh, let, let's look at uh, the sources of political power. I think uh, you identified several. One of them would be money, correct? That's a source of political power in the United States? Um, yes. And that's one of the ways to cajole a legislator is to make campaign contributions to him or her, correct? Uh, or threaten to make contributions to his or her potential opponent. Either way, you can get power that way. That's yes. right. All right, and, and for some groups, their biggest political resource is their cash, correct? Um, yes, but I think that that varies a little bit by group. So, for example, things like trade associations, when we think of groups representing groups of corporations, they don't really have voters to mobilize, so money is their contribution to the political system. In other cases, votes are actually a much bigger deal. So we can think of some demographic groups who turn out to vote in large numbers, even though they don't have a particularly great amount of resources. So there's an, it's an uneven balance, and it just depends on the type of group. It varies from group to group. And, and some groups have a meaningful degree of political power, largely because of their financial resources, correct? Um, I, would, I would be willing to, to agree with that, yep. 
Uh, and in assessing the political power of a group, the size of the group is clearly an important factor, correct? Uh, clearly. And in terms of other factors that might be as important, one such other factor would be financial resources because they play such a large role in the political system, correct? That's correct. And the LGBT community and their allies outraised the yes on eight groups, correct? In nominal dollars donated to the um, campaign fund tracked by the FPPC, that's correct. They raised uh, approximately $43 million, the no on eight groups did, is that correct? That's my understanding. And the yes on eight groups raised approximately $40 million, is that correct? Uh, in nominal dollars, yes, that's my understanding. <coughs> All right, and now let's turn to tab 18, which is uh, DIX 1329. It's the uh, 2008 annual report for the Human Rights Campaign. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 14. The page numbers appear at the bottom left-hand part of the page in microscopic Microscopic font. print, that's yes. right. So tell me when you're there, sir. Uh, to the extent I can see it, I am there. Okay. Uh, and turning your attention to the right-hand uh, series of numbers under revenue and support, it lists total revenue and support, $45.97 million uh, for the year uh, 2008. Do you see that? Uh, yes. All right. And uh, that's a lot more than the NAACP raised in 2008, isn't it? I have no idea. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1329. No objection. 1329 is admitted. Political participation in the form of resource contributions is a luxury item in, ter in economic terms, correct? Um, yes. So uh, if you have scarce resources and you need to allocate them across food, rent, health insurance, um, then political contributions for most people would rank lower on the list. Than food. Than food, yes. <laughs> uh, you would want to look at the disposable income of individuals in a group to know their ability to c contribute financially, correct? Um, that would be one issue you would look at. That's correct. But you have not undertaken an economic analysis of what the disposable income available to gays and lesbians is in the United States, correct? I have not. You do not have an opinion as to what the median income is for gay men in the United States, correct? I do not. And you do not have an opinion as to what the median income is for lesbians in the United States, correct? No. Nope. And you do not have an opinion on whether gays and lesbians have less disposable income than heterosexuals, correct? I don't have an opinion on that. But one factor that affects the level of disposable income is the number of dependents in a household because that dependents absorb resources, correct? That's true. And it's true that on average, gay male couples are less likely to have children in their household than heterosexual couples, correct? That seems likely. And in fact, uh, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 19, which is DIX 1162. This is a report authored by uh, Lee Badgett and others, uh, March 2009, and uh, directing your attention to page six, top of the page. It states, about half, 48.7, of married couples have children under 18 years old, compared to 27.3% of lesbian couples and 11.3% of gay male couples. And you don't have any reason to doubt those numbers, do you? I, I, I don't know their source, so I can't speak to them in any way. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1162. Very well, 1162 is admitted. But you would agree that the number of gays and lesbians who actually make contributions to political causes uh, is quite high, correct? Um, you, I would have to ask quite high with respect to what? So if you're asking as a percentage of the known population of the group, um, while I haven't undertaken an analysis of that, my suspicion would be that that's correct, that among gays and lesbians we could observe a higher proportion of them would give money to politics for all the reasons we've already discussed here today, the frequency with which their identity is a source of political contestation. Um, 
the, the relative size of the contributions and the relative numbers of individuals giving contributions uh, I'm less confident about because gays are such a small portion of the population um, a, a very small group of people has to make an awful lot of donations. Um, now uh, you would agree though that the internet has made it easier for gays and lesbians to mobilize politically, correct? I believe the internet has made it easier for everyone to mobilize politically. Um, uh, political scientists have uh, seldom observed uh, such a change in, in political circumstances as we have in the last 20 years. But isn't it uh, the internet particularly useful for groups who wish to remain invisible? Um, I would think that it certainly makes uh, life a little bit simpler for them. That's true. Uh, now, with the $43 million that the No on 8 groups were able to raise, did they spend a lot of that on TV ads? Um, I actually don't know the internal workings on the No on 8 campaign. My own perusal of the television suggests that they spent a fair amount of money on television, yes. And they were able to get their message out to the voters to get the voters' attention. Is that fair to say? Um, they were able to get a message out. So the, the reason I'm a little bit cautious here is that campaign activities take place in a variety of different contexts. So some of them are advertising, some of them are precinct walking, some of them are get out the vote efforts uh, immediately before and on election day, some of them are absentee ballot efforts. Um, so when I look at the total amount of effort put forward, it's much harder to say whether or not the campaign um, feels it was conducted uh, effectively or whether they would do things differently or whatever. I think it is fair to say that many Californians saw a commercial on the subject of Prop 8 from the No campaign. Now let, let's turn our attention to access. Uh, you, you would agree that it's a good thing for a group in terms of its political power if it has regular access to important poli political figures, correct? Um, that would depend on a definition of access, uh, which uh, I believe we have to be careful in defining. Uh, so access implies uh, the meaningful opportunity to uh, strongly signal to a decision maker what your preferences are uh, and to have that decision maker respond to that cue. Um, nevertheless, certainly meeting with an elected official is better for the group than not meeting with the elected official access to federal office holders is the most valuable favor that a party is able to give in exchange for large donations, correct? Hmm. Um, I'm inclined to agree with that, but I'm trying to think if there are other things within the law, boundaries of the law that a party could agree to provide in exchange for a contribution. So um, it seems reasonable. All right. And access in itself shows that in a general sense, an office holder favors someone or that someone has influence on the office holder, correct? Objection or compound question. All right. I'll, I'll break it apart. A access in itself shows that in a general sense, an office holder favors someone, correct? No. Uh, or uh, access shows a, in a general sense that someone has influence on the office holder, correct? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say no again, and the reason I'm resistant to both of those things is that there's a, there's a fine tradition in both Washington and Sacramento of providing access to both sides in order to um, accept their, their um, contributions, etc. Uh, so it's not clear, just access alone suggests that the person favors your viewpoint. You can't identify a single issue on which the leaders of the LGBT community have been unable to get a hearing before Nancy Pelosi on, correct? During her speakership. Um, so, of course, I don't know the, the private communications in, in Speaker Pelosi's office, so I, 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 as a factual matter, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, if you're asking me, do I believe that gays and lesbians are able to meet with Speaker Pelosi. Um, I would assume that that is so. She's a Democratic representative representing the city and county of San Francisco, so it would seem unlikely that she would refuse to eat them. And she has been vocally supportive of uh, a number of gay issues, though um, she's now she's resisting bringing some things to a vote. But but I think that that's a that's what I know about that. <laughs>
All right, now uh, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 20 in your binder. Okay. And um, do you have a, a chart before you? I do. And um, you, you spoke in terms of political power that one thing you need to assess is the feeling that the general public has towards a group, correct? Correct. And you, used, uh, you made reference to a feeling thermometer, correct? That's correct. And if we look at this chart, we can see that uh, in the sixth column, it says GL mean temp, and that's the temperature for the gay and lesbian community, correct? That's correct. And in 1984, it stood at 30. Is that right? Um, because I can't see the wording of the questions, I, I don't know for sure that it's always the same question. But if you represent to me that it is, then yes, it appears that the mean thermometer score was 30 in 1984. And today it's at 49.4, correct? That's correct. And so that we see that there's been a consistent <laughs> trend in terms of a more favorable uh, more warm feeling towards gays and lesbians in the United States over the last 25 years, correct? Um, correct with a footnote, and that is that there's a possibility of a secular trend in the feeling thermometers of all respondents on all groups. So I would want to net that out because I don't have all that data at my hands. I can't, I can't do it out of, out of thin air. But there could be a secular trend in favor of warmness, but it is the case that those numbers have gone up, yes. At uh, <coughs> the form of global warming? <laughs> Among the electorate, Your Honor, yes. We like everybody better now. Uh, now let's talk about allies. You, you referenced the importance of allies during your direct testimony, correct? I did. And, and you would agree that allies can be a source of political power, correct? Um, yes, uh, with, with constraints. So not every ally is in the position to provide the assistance that the group needs at a particular time. So it, it's, it's going to be particular to the, the area of contestation. For example, a state legislative ally can't help you in Congress, a simple example. Um, and then the second would be that uh, some allies are more reliable than others, as I've indicated. And in your opinion, an ally is a group or individual who is repeatedly embracing uh, the gay position from the perspective of gays and lesbians, correct? Um, I would go a step further and say that an ally is, is um, uh, an individual or a group who are willing to expend political capital on behalf of that position, not merely embrace it. And I, I'd like to actually, I, I think this will be the only time I make you do this, go back in your binder, for which I apologize, but back to uh, tab 14. Uh, and this is uh, a book entitled Gays and Lesbians in the Democratic Process. Uh, and you contributed uh, a chapter to this book, is that right? I did. And uh, th we can see it on the third page uh, behind the tab. Your chapter is called Institutions Matter, Local Electoral Laws, Gay and Lesbian Representation, and Coalition Building Across Minority Communities, correct? That's correct. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 236. Okay. Okay, and the last paragraph on the page starts, the value of coalition building is clearly not lost on the gay and lesbian leadership who have worked for years to build partnerships with racial and ethnic groups, friendly religious groups such as Jews, organized labor, and other organized interests. And that's a true statement, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, now, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 21 in your binder, which is DIX 1331. I'm it, sorry, tab number again? Uh, 21. It's DIX 1331, which is the Human Rights Campaign <coughs> Annual Report for 2009. I'm there. And it starts on the second page of this uh, document. Uh, in all caps, finally, with strong allies in the White House and Capitol Hill and across the country, would you agree that uh, the Obama administration is more favorable to the political interests of gays and lesbians than the Bush administration was? Um, so that, that, 
that was a nice little um, switch. So I would agree, yes, that Obama is more favorable than Bush, though I think the degree of difference is far smaller than uh, most progressive voters anticipated. I would not agree with the capitalized notion that finally there are strong allies, et cetera. Well, well let's turn to page five of this document and to the first bullet point, which says, the president launched a national AIDS strategy and set key goals to lower the number of new HIV infections, increase the number of people receiving care, and reduce racial disparities. And, and that's evidence that President Obama is an ally of the LGBT community, correct? Um, it strikes me that that is not a particularly persuasive point because um, for a number of reasons. The first is that uh, uh, an equally plausible explanation is that the, the president is an ally of public health. Um, second, and this is going to sound strange, but um, actually HIV prevention, particularly in the lesser developed world, was an area of strength for President Bush. In fact, it's uh, one of the more um, laudable aspects of his administration that groups both gay and straight uh, gave him substantial credit for. So I don't I'm not able to evaluate the Bush administration's anti-HIV strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Obamas, um, but I'm, it's not clear on its face that this is necessarily a big step on behalf of gays. Do you know what this is talking about? Are you familiar with the uh, initiatives and strategies that are referenced here? Um, the specifics of them, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, and now let's turn to the second bullet point. We are on our way to eliminating the HIV travel ban. To get here, HRC lobbied Congress effectively, resulting in the vote that paved the way. Uh, then when the Department of Health and Human Services issued a proposed regulation, HRC members submitted 17,000 of the 19,000 public comments that HHS received. Soon the, the process will be complete and the discriminatory ban will be gone. And that's been something that the LGBT community has sought, correct? That is something that the LGBT community has sought in concert with the scientific community. And that's evidence of the political power of the LGBT community, correct? Um, I would not go quite so far. So the first is that we're talking about a letter writing campaign uh, to an administrative oversight agency, which is not a particularly highly salient um, undertaking, uh, kind of flies under the political radar. The second is that there was huge pressure on the part of university uh, medical centers receiving NIH grants to eliminate the HIV travel ban because it put U.S. AIDS researchers, who are among the world's leading AIDS researchers, in the uncomfortable position of not being able to host the International AIDS Conference in the United States because individuals with HIV could not actually attend. Um, so there was a lot of different forms of public pressure on this issue prior to the proposed regulation change, which did in fact go into, into effect. And turning to the next bullet point, it says, we advocated for the administration to ban discrimination on the basis of gender identity in the nation's largest workforce, the federal government, and they did. And that's something that the LGBT community has sought, correct? Um, it is something that they sought. And it's evidence of the political power of the LGBT community, correct? It is certainly one outcome that would weigh positively. My understanding was that this was done in the form of a presidential directive, so I'm not sure the legislative vibrancy of this, uh, if it will survive this administration, but it's certainly a positive consideration. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, uh, would it be possible to take a, a short break? Or? Lunch and breaks and so forth, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all grateful for your suggestions. <laughs> Thank you, Why don't we take 10 minutes? Is that enough? Yeah, yes, thank you, Your Honor. Right.